welcome. Good morning, Impact. How's everybody doing today? It's Pastor Anthony. We are going to do a little something a little different today. We are uh, doing worship online uh, with Juet. So I'm going to bring Juet in right now so he can lead us in worship. But Father God, uh, as we go into a time of worship, a time of your grace, a time of your presence, Lord, we just lift up Juet right now. We lift up his words, his voices, music, musical talents that you have given him, Father God. We expect and wait for your Holy Spirit to just fall upon us to break out in, in, in praise and worship in your holy name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, Pastor. All right. Good morning, church. Hope, hope everyone's doing well today. So, yeah, so today is going to be a little different. We are all at home. Hope you guys are being safe in the snow right now if you're in Chicago. Um, but right now we're just worshiping from home and the spirit of God is wherever his believers are worshiping him. Amen. So today we are going to sing a uh, friend of God first and just acknowledge like, wow, it's amazing that we are friends of God. Jesus Christ came and died for us so that we can be friends with him for all eternity. So let's get excited wherever you're at. Everyone can stand to your feet and let's give some worship and praise to God. excited that God calls us friends. We want to give him all the praise and worship today. God, we lift your name on high this morning, Jesus. No matter how much rain, no matter how much snow, anything that comes our way, God, we want to worship you and put you first, Lord. Sing God Almighty. Me. Mm -hmm. 
today, God, in our homes, God, we just pray, God, that there's a spirit of worship, God. God, wherever you are, God, there we worship, there we praise. And we are so excited that we can come to you and just pray openly. Lift your name on high. And we want to worship you. Church, now we're going to sing the heart of worship. put other three things on the throne at certain times, God. I just want to ask for your forgiveness for that, God. Sometimes we put our situations, our stress on the throne. Sometimes we put our jobs on the throne. Things that we worship for it. And I just want to lay it all at your feet and come back to the heart of worship today. There's amazing all this strength away and I simply become longing just to
today we want to bring you more than a song. More than these lyrics that we see on the screen. We want to bring you more than a song. Let's sing that out. more about community and being in fellowship today, Lord. Let our hearts be open to you, to one another. And we pray, God, that you receive all the glory today. Hallelujah. First, give him a hand clap of praise wherever you are. Let's give him the worship that he deserves. Amen. All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is uh, awesome. Give him a praise. Give him some honor right now. Let, let me get my mic going. Bear with us. New system, new day uh, here today. So I'm excited to be with y'all. I, I thank you, Juet, again for um, leading us in a time of worship. That was awesome. And you know what? The first song is just so true. We are a friend of God and, and we are built for community. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But at Impact, we truly believe in um, not just worshiping with our words, but with actions. And, and how do we do that with actions? Well, we do that at Impact with our tithes and offerings. Uh, if you, it is time to be able to give, and we have a couple different ways to give. One is uh, you can mail in an offering at Impact Church, uh, P.O. Box 155, Maywood, Illinois, 60153. You can also donate online at impact-church-maywood.org. Um, there's, and there is a verse in the, in the Bible in Nehemiah, and I want to talk about Nehemiah and, and what he's doing is you guys prepare your offerings. You, like you said, you can go online and do that. You can always mail it in. You can always call myself. But it says in Nehemiah, we obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our, of our ground and the first fruits of all our fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord. Also to bring to the house of our God to the priest who minister in the house of the Lord, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle as, as it is written in the law. 
I, I, the reason I, I, I want to talk about this is Nehemiah was known for rebuilding the wall, the, the wall of Jerusalem after the Israelites were captive, uh, were basically enslaved for 70 years. And uh, what's he, what, what he's really doing is he's preparing them again for worship. They're pre preparing them again for giving uh, a, a time of temple worship, which they're not used to anymore. They've been captives. They haven't been able to worship God in their own home like they that like they were supposed to be doing. And this is what Nehemiah is reestablishing. He's reestablishing the law in regards to offerings and tithes. And I just find it just so beautiful that it says that they obligated themselves to bring the first fruits of basically everything of the ground of the fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord and that's what we do today we're going to bring our first fruits the first giving of the week the first giving of the new month because tomorrow is February right man time flies but let as we prepare to let, let's just pray over these offerings really quick father God we just thank you for today we thank you for the snow we thank you for our homes we thank you for our food we thank you for the blessings that you give us father god large and small that we don't even recognize and realize sometimes but lord we bring you our first fruits we bring you our best we don't we we don't hold back from you father god because you didn't hold back from us you gave us the best you gave us your son and lord we call upon him now to bless these offerings to bless the people about to give father god that we do it with an open heart not out of obligation not because of the law because we love you because you we learned that from you you loved us so much you gave you gave us your son and we're giving back you what's rightfully yours, the first fruits of all. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen, amen. As you guys prepare today, we got a short little video for announcements. Please stay tuned and watch this. Hello and welcome to Impact Church. If you are a first time guest, whether in person or online, we are so happy to have you with us today. We hope to be able to learn more about you. So please fill out a connection card and follow us on our social media platforms via Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our pages and please share with your friends and family as well. Today is Communion Sunday. We will be partaking in communion at the end of service. So this will give you time to get your coffee, tea, juice, or water, as well as your toast, crackers, or cookies. Remember to invite your family to join in during this time of communion. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. This famous line is from Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. In it, we see one of the main characters give their life for another. What is it about friendship that would cause a person to do this? Is friendship that important? The Bible shares that real friendship, community, is one of the most important things a Christian needs. So join us next weekend as we start our new series. We are going to look at how we are created for community, not in a tale of two cities, but a tale of two gardens, live on Facebook or in person. Live at five Wednesday nights. Join us for food for your soul. Grab the family and your dinner for a time of worship and a short devotional. Come hungry and leave filled with his word. Then join us on Sundays right after service at 1130, live in person or via Zoom. As we go further into God's word with a study on the book of James, we will learn the nuts and bolts of what it means to live a Christian life. Coming up this February is our Food for Your Soul class. This will be an amazing class filled with nutritional fun where we will learn and coach on healthy eating habits. What an important step this is in this journey to nourishing our bodies. When our body is healthy, our mind and mental health can also flourish. When our body and mind can function properly, then our spirit and soul can more easily be worked on as well. We want our entire body to be fed correctly as we work as one body in Christ. 
If you would like to sign up for Food for Your Soul, let us know in the comments on this Facebook live feed. If you are joining us in person, you can sign up at the connections table as you leave today. This class will be available to you in person and virtually on Zoom. Let us know if you're in so we can get you the materials that you will need. Thank you. All right. Hey, I've got a couple just really quick announcements. Uh, two other ones. Um, there's a free Bible club for kids going on. Uh, this is the Maywood Ministry Resource Center. It launches a virtual good news club. That's what it's called, the good news club. Uh, and it's going to be Wednesdays at Wednesday afternoons from 3 30 to five o'clock and they're going to be teaching the kids about a bible-based story but also um it's an after-school program that is going to also help kids read so if you're interested there's the registration down there i i believe tracy's going to be sending the, an email to all the, the parent the parents um to if you want to register your child uh, that is super cool this is a great little ministry uh, check out their website. They do some amazing stuff. And then next Sunday is Super Bowl Sunday. I am a football fanatic. I like watching football, college football, any football. Um, so we're going to have a cool, fun little thing to do. Uh, if we are in person, awesome. If we're not, awesome. What I need you to do is wear your favorite sports team next week or any team that you have if you don't have a sports uh, shirt. And I need you to take a picture and send me that picture. You can, and, and, and I just realized my mic wasn't on. Um, so that, that, so this next Sunday is Super Bowl Sunday, and we're going to have a little contest with Super Bowl Sunday. And um, so do me a favor, wear your favorite outfit, your favorite team jersey it doesn't matter if it's football basketball baseball whatever uh and wear it take a picture of yourself and text me or message me who you think is going to win the 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 super bowl and by how many points and the closest one that wins this contest is going to get a, a, a gift card to your favorite place okay so again take a i need a picture though i need pictures and your, uh, who you think is going to win and by how many points and the closest one to that uh, will win a special gift, a special gift card, okay? And that last one was free Bible club for kids. This is an after-school program teaching a Bible story and reading to your children if they need help in reading. So there's the, the, the website to where to go register and check out their website. It's Children Evangelism Fellowship of Chicago. Great, great, great organization that we are going to be um, dealing with and partnering with a little more. So, all right, with all that said, let's get down to the brass tacks, why we are here. Um, and like Gabby said in the announcements, we're starting a new series today, and I'm excited about it. It's a, a short series, but uh, she said it was the best of times. It was the worst of times, and that's a line from the from a Dickens book, right? A tale of two city, two cities, and in that story are these main characters, and one of them gives his life for another. And I want you to think: it is is are you willing to do that for your friend? Is friendship to you that important that you would uh, that you would allow yourself the opportunity to give your life for them? Is friendship that important to you that you would care enough for somebody to do that? The Bible shares that real friendship, real community is one of the most important things that we need as a Christian. So we're going to look at today at how we are created for community. And it's, it is, it's a tale of two cities that we're going to, not two cities that we're going to talk about, but a tale of two gardens that we're going to talk about today. So, but before we start off with that, we got to realize something. We got, I want us to look at our, our brains real quick, if we could. Can I actually look at it? No, I can't. But studies have, and, and our brains are wired to be with others. They literally are wired to be with others. There, there's studies out there that um, 
that's that are just on this on social psychology and and it speaks to this need so uh, just researchers show that there's an incredible link between social isolation and negative mental health and one of our people in our church this week i mentioned it on wednesday they they were struggling this week with social isolation with uh, mental health issues with spiritual issues why because when we isolate ourselves our thoughts go north it, 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 actually they go south instead of going north instead of going up to god they go south and they start they start spiraling out of control and social isolation uh, is a true risk factor for uh for poor overall cognitive performance um for faster cognitive decline poor executive functioning and, and and more negativity and depression in our lives it's high they, there's studies that show a heightened sensitivity to social threats because we're isolating ourselves so every little thing that we hear on the news or uh what people say threatens our our um threatens us socially and in in these are problems see see being so socially uh, isolated from people it also causes health problems it causes loneliness right high can cause hypertension in people diabetes it can compre uh, compromise your immune system these are all studies that have been taken about this and, and, and the crazy thing is that this research showed that it doesn't matter if you're even surrounded by a lot of people. So you could live in a big monster city like the city of Chicago and the Midtown Manhattan study found that people still feel isolated even living in a big town, crowded town. And right now we, we are seeing a lot of people like that. And you know what? So what's so even more amazing is all these studies were done before the pandemic so all the stuff that i'm talking about right here about your brain and how we think cognitively these studies were all done before the pandemic and now what we're finding out that this is even a bigger risk for us now the social isolation and i, I know some of you might know some of you don't there's a bunch of us that have been taken and have finished and uh, taking mental health classes so we could coach people on mental health stuff. Um, and, and we're seeing that the problem is just so strong right now. And so many people are struggling with this. And as I was reading through and studying these classes, uh, it showed me my own struggles, which I have lots of struggles. I never realized how many struggles I had until I took this class uh, and how to cope with them. And it's amazing what happens truly amazing what happens when we isolate ourselves from others for too long of a time see we're wired to be with people we are wired to have interaction with people uh have we always been this way have we always been wired to uh to want to be with people is, or is this something new no it's not something new and in order to get to the answer to that we have to look to the first garden the first garden is the garden of eden right it was that was the best of times the first garden the best of times why do i say that is because we walked with god then god was with us and and that's what we're going to look at real quick in genesis 2 god creates the heavens the earth the, the waters the sea the animals right and then he creates man and, and in chapter 2 verse 18 through 20 it says then God, then, then the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. And he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the, the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, all the wild animals. But still, there was no helper just right for him. Do you see that? There's no helper just right for him. God gave him permission, said, name them. There's animals, there's dogs, there's cats, there's lepers, there's 
all kinds of animals. There's plants, name them. And then he realizes, the man realizes, man, none of them look like me. None of them talk like me. None of them act like me. I, there's not a su suitable one for me. And he was longing for that, that, that companion. He, now don't get me wrong. He has God, but even the animals had mates, right? If a boy and a girl, they mate, right? He had dogs. We call dogs man's best friend, right? But the intimacy with a dog is not the same as a person. He needed another person in order for him to do his life with, some, somebody to do his life with, which was good. And as, as we look into Genesis 21, uh, verse 21, it says, so the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and he closed up the opening. Then the Lord made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. And at last, the man exclaimed, I love that, at last. Did he, did he exclaim at last because he was excited that he had uh, a woman to call his wife? No, he was excited because he had a mate that looked like him, that talked like him, that acted like him, that walked like him. Uh, later on, he would find out the benefits of the woman, right? But that wasn't why he, he was excited and said at last. He said at last because now he had somebody to do life with. He had a mate, he had a friend, he had community. See, at last, he wasn't alone. We have all had this need to be social since the beginning of time. All right, we've all had this need to be social from the beginning of time. We have all had this need to be social since the beginning of the time. It's important that we realize one thing though. This is actually before the fall. It's not like we needed others because we didn't have God. See, they had God in their lives. This is before the fall. They, so they had themselves, they had the animals, the plants, the ocean. They had God with them, walking and doing life with them at this time. See, community is part of God's perfect plan for us. Even the animals, think about it, had others like themselves to do life with, which was good. See, the Garden of Eden is, was the example of what lives were created to be walking with God, partnering together, the best of times, a time of living in peace. But as soon as they disobey God and, and they have to leave the garden, what do we see? While we see people not partnering with each other, we see people getting in trouble with each other. Now fast forward a little, and Cain and Abel come into the picture. They get the, Adam and Eve get cast out because of sin. The sin comes into the world because of the apple and eating the apple and disobeying the Lord. And we get all that. But Adam and Eve have children named Cain and Abel, and, and they're grown now. And they're out in the fields. And Cain is, uh, is basically a farmer and he's doing his crops. And Abel is a shepherd and he's taking care of his, his, his sheep and his shepherd and, and his lambs. And something happens. And, and in verse uh, in Genesis 4, verses 3 through 5, it says, When it came time to harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. And Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lamb from his flock. And the Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very ang angry, and he looked de de uh, dejected. Now, let's think about this. In verse 7, it goes on to say, 6 and 7, real quick. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you, th why do you look so dejected? You'll be you will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. 
Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and become its master. See, Cain had the same opportunity as Abel. As if Cain's heart wasn't in the right place. The community he had with Cain, with his brother Abel, was good at one point. And then, like it said in Nehemiah, they brought the first fruits and the first of their cattle. But it said that Cain presented some of his crops, some of them. And Abel got brought, uh, it says, the best portions of the firstborn. See, when Cain gave, it wasn't with his heart. It wasn't the best. There's only some. And sometimes in relationships uh, with God, relationships in our, with our friends, our families, we only bring some of ourselves when we need to bring all like Abel. We need to bring all at, like Abel did because the, we were made for this community. That's what Abel was doing, building this community. And it says that, that Cain, he got angry and he looked dejected, but the Lord told him, if you do what's right, you keep your heart pure and you do what's right, everything will be accepted. But if you, f you refuse to, you got to watch out because sin is going to be at that door knocking. And he's going to want to control you. And then after, after this, that's exactly what happens. Cain goes out and kills his brother. He kills Abel. And after that, the Lord has a conversation with them. And he said... <laughs> And it doesn't go very well. What actually happens is the Lord banishes Cain from the land, from his sight. He gives him a mark so other people wouldn't kill him and wouldn't associate with him. And he basically, he throws him out of his presence and he curses him and he tells him he's going to be a homeless wanderer with no community. What's missing do you see what's missing in his life now? Friends and family, people that loved him and cared for him, that wanted to be there with him, the relationship with God. There's no community there. Who does Cain, who's Cain able to talk to after God casts him out of his presence? Later on, we learn if you keep reading about him, he, had, he is married, he does have a kid. But sometimes you need more than just your wife. I'm not saying that don't get advice and, and, and community from your wife is, is great. Tracy's awesome at it and she's great at advice and stuff like that. But sometimes we need others in our lives also. Who, who can he go run to to get pray, prayed for? He doesn't have anybody. He's, he's going to be a wanderer for the rest of his life. See, we weren't we were not created to be alone. We were not created to be wanderers. We were created for community. We were not created to be alone. And what, what happens is bad things start to happen when we go against God's will in our lives. So God's will was not for us to be left alone, like I said. And I, there was a time in my life, and sometimes even now, that I have to catch myself. But I remember <clears throat> when I was... Um, doing a lot of drugs and drinking and all that stuff in my life, I would isolate myself. I would, I never want, I didn't want to be with people. I, I didn't want to associate with people. And I like being with people. Don't get me wrong. But during these times, I would isolate myself. My mind would go <clears throat> down corridors, rabbit holes that were not good. They weren't even close to being godly thoughts. But here's the but. One little redheaded girl kept coming back and finding me because she believed in me. She trusted me. I don't know why. She cared for me. And she knew community was important. She literally, I remember this one time she came over and I told my dad, I heard the doorbell. I said, don't, I don't want to be bothered. Don't let anybody in. 
My phone was blowing up all day because people were trying to get a hold of me and I was isolating myself. I didn't want any, any, um, anything to do with anybody. And my dad left her in the house and it was Tracy. She did, he, she, she, she would find me and come and look for me because she understood community is important in people's life. See, research, scripture, history, they have all shown us that we're created for community. We are cre created for community. And so how do we find the right community? That's the important thing. And that was my, that's my point about Tracy. She was the right community. See, we need to accumulate, accumulate friends who will give godly advice. We need to accumulate friends who will give godly advice. Cain could have probably found yes men, people that would have agreed with what he did and justify what he did was okay. He, probably, he, he could have found people like that. But those aren't the people we need to surround ourselves with. We need Christians who can speak into our lives bi biblically. That they can give us godly wisdom into our lives, not worldly wisdom, amen? Not, not, not ways of this world, but godly wisdom to lead us down the right path, amen? See, I say accumulate there because having more than one friend that can speak into our life, it's practical. It's not just practical, it's biblical. In Proverbs, it says plans go wrong for lack of advice, and many advisors bring success. That Hebrew word there for plan, it says plans go. The Hebrew word for that is translated thoughts. So when our thoughts here, when our thoughts go wrong for lack of advice, many advisors bring success. Because our thoughts, they come from our desires. And our desires build on these thoughts. And our thoughts determine our actions. Jesus said in, in Mark, for from within, out of a man's heart, come evil thoughts, right? Evil desires, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. This is exactly what Cain was all about, wasn't he? Sounds like Cain, right? Out of his heart, evil desires came. And James, right, James writes in chapter one, each man is tempted when by his own evil desires, his own evil thoughts, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. I've taught, right? But having many people, when we go to make a big decision in life, or we get frustrated and overcome with anxiety or grief or uh, something in our life that's just so overwhelming or when we're dealing with addictions or sinful desires having many people in our lives brings success it says in proverbs it brings success so how do we have how do we have so who, i'm sorry who do you have in your life that can give you godly advice. I remember when we got married, um, my father-in-law gave Tracy and I advice about our marriage. And he said, go find somebody that you can talk to about your marriage separate uh, than your wife. Meaning if you have a problem with your wife, don't complain to her at it about it. Find a friend a male friend for you, Anthony, or a female friend for you, Tracy. And that person is your confidant. You can speak anything to them and they can't judge your marriage. They, they can give you advice if they ask for it, but they can't tell anybody else about it. Then they said, that's your one person that you can go to. And we use that system. She has somebody and I have somebody. And, and how do we 
Uh, so who who do you and they can and they speak advice into our lives, godly advice into our lives. Who do you have speaking godly advice into your lives? If you're in business, you build teams of people, right? In the church, we build teams of people. Uh, who 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 are you bouncing all ideas off of about your your life, about your personal life, about your business life, about your spiritual life, about parenting? Do you have a spiritual mother or father who is pouring into your life, giving you godly advice? And better yet, I want you to think about this. Who are you giving advice to? And if you are, is it godly advice? Is it Christian advice? Is it biblical? See, because uh, there's a theme in scripture that we see throughout. People that don't get good godly advice, they make big mistakes. When they, and when they don't have friends who can speak freely into their lives. See, building Christian community should be important to us. You know why? Because it was important to Jesus, amen? See, the second garden, is that, that's where we learn this from. The second garden. And the second garden is the garden of Gethsemane. All right, where this is where Jesus is about to go... <laughs> He's, he just had the Passover dinner. He's going to pray. Judas just leaves him to go do what he's got to go do. And he knows what, what is in front of him. And this is going to be his worst of times. And he goes to this garden to go pray. Because he knows he's about to go to the cross for us and to sacrifice his life for us. So what does this garden teach us about community? Well, let's go to that passage in Mark 14. It says, they went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. And he, if you notice, it says he took Peter, James, and John with him. He didn't go alone. And it says he became deeply troubled and distressed. And he told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point. So stay here and keep watch over me. And keep watch with me. Gethsemane. Sounds like a beautiful place. Olive Gardens, I'm Italian. I like olive oil. It probably smelled beautiful in there, but it was probably a nice, quiet place to go sit, pray, be a little isolated with your father. I'm not saying being isolated all the time is a bad thing. Sometimes we need to be quiet with the Lord and wait and listen, but this wasn't one of those times for Jesus. This time for Jesus was a time that he needed his community he needed his parents he needed his his friends to be with him he was at the lowest point in his life and i say that because he was human he, he might have been god he may have not might have been he is god but he's in human form right now and he felt and he had emotions and he and he cared just like us and this was one of that this is his lowest point, it says his soul is crushed with grief. Talk about mental and spiritual support he needed at this point. His soul is crushed with grief. So what is, what is support that Jesus need? He needs his inner circle just to be there with him, just to stay there with him. For those who believe, for, for those of you guys that believe that Jesus didn't need community, that's not true. Jesus needed community. Like I said, in our hardest times, in our darkest times, this is when the enemy comes to seek and destroy. Think about when Jesus went, he just got baptized and goes into the woods, and into the wilderness, and he goes to be isolated with the Lord and pray and fast, and who shows up? But temptation, the devil. Uh, right <clears throat> now he was praying and fasting and and he was isolated on purpose for this to pray and fast but who showed up the devil see when we isolate ourselves and it's not for the will of god and the purpose of god and it's because we're in a bad place emotionally spiritually physically mentally then it's easy for the devil to creep in and this is what was happening right now Jesus needed his inner circle. He needed his support. The enemy loves 
isolating us. And he loves for us to believe lies that during the time dur during these times, we shouldn't bother anybody with our problems. This is exactly what the lady said to me uh, <clears throat> after I, I found out that uh, on Wednesday that she was struggling. Pastor, I didn't want to bother you. It's not a bother. We're supposed to be shepherds. We're supposed to be helping each other. We're supposed to be encouraging each other. And we believe, so please don't ever think you're bothering somebody at church about your problems, about where you are mentally or physically or spiritually. This is what we're supposed to do as a church. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people believe the lie that if I show you my emotions and I, I'm weak, and that's a lie also. Or you believe the lie that I'm so mature, uh, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm mature spiritually. I don't need anybody else. I don't need their support. Again, it's another lie. Jesus needed community. See, we're called Christians. We're called followers of Christ. So let's be like him and seek out a good inner circle. An inner circle isn't just strictly about socializing, okay? It's not just about hanging out and, and playing games and, and socializing with people. Jesus leans on his friends. He told them, sit here and keep watch. Sit there and keep watch. Watch means to give uh, strict attention to. And that's what we need at times. We need people watching out for us, watching out are watching the backs for us not not only to give us support but make sure that we're just doing okay in life and health and finances and our spirituality this is why we're doing food for your soul this class is more than just eating right or reading the bible this class is about helping us with our mental thoughts and teachings and coaching you on how to eat healthy how to how to have your body working with your spirit mind and soul and and everything working together so you so so you're in a good place so, and it's about community. So if you haven't registered, if you haven't let me know that you want to sign up, it will be happening probably in the middle of March or February. So please let me know because we do have stuff to get to you guys. But it's it's an important class. It's, it's, it's another reason why the ladies have been reaching out to the other ladies in the church through text messages and emails and phone calls and sending cards to each other just to do check-ins hopefully you've received your wellness check-in and this is another reason why i call and text a lot of you and i pray for you throughout the week and the, the month because we are to keep watch over each other amen not keeping watch over each other to judge each other about what you're doing what's happening no 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 that's the whole exact opposite in first thessalonians it says so we can encourage each other and build each other up just as they were doing see jesus was he, he was doing god's will he was giving his life freely for you and me but it doesn't mean it was easy See, he was fully God, but he was also fully man. He needed encouragement, just like you and I. And that's what First Thessalonians 5.11 teaches us, that we need to, to do this so we can encourage each other, build each other up. All right? We, we need to do that. Jesus knew that everyone needed encouragement. So he constantly encouraged others. And Luke, we, as, when he sends everybody out, he chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to the towns and, and the places that they were going to visit. Why did he send them out in pairs? He sent them in pairs because when you have a, a peer, a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, somebody that's close to you, you, you have somebody watching out for you. And they encouraging you. And this is exactly what was happening. This is why he was sending them out in pairs. So they would be encouraged by each other. I like watching cop shows. And we watch NCIS Los Angeles sometimes. And there's a couple in there, Deeks and Kenzie. And they, they're their partners. And they know each other left and right. They always have their backs for each other. 
but they're always encouraging each other during good times and bad times. His partners know each other. That's why Jesus is sending this out together, not alone. Jesus didn't do ministry alone, did he? He always had somebody with him. Paul never did ministry alone. And we learned that in Acts. And in Acts 13, 2, it says, One day these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, and the Holy Spirit came upon him and appointed Barnabas and Saul for special works, work to which he called them to do. Did these men need, uh, were these men in need of some kind of help? No, that's not it at all. They were better together, they were stronger together. When we do things together, impact, involve many people and create teamwork, right? It's like what Ecclesiastes says, two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed. If one falls, the other can reach out, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying closer together can keep each other warm. But how can one person, uh, can one, one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. But three, meaning even more or better, or even better, for a triple granted cord is not easily broken. See, we weren't meant to do life alone. We were meant to live in a community, a community of believers, so we can help. We don't see, we never see the disciples traveling alone. Jesus didn't do life alone, like I said. He didn't do ministry alone. And this should tell us something about our journeys in life. Or, or, or do you believe that you're better than them? Or do you think I can just handle everything on my own? If you do, you're absolutely wrong. Because like I said, we are built for community. That's why Jesus set that standard, set this standard. It was for our own good. But, 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 but pastor, I've... I've let people into my lives. I, I, I've tried to do life with others and I've got hurt. My answer to that is awesome. You're just like Jesus. Jesus let 12 men into his life, close friends, and they all abandoned him at one point. What? One of them even gets him killed. See, we all get hurt at one point in our lives. That can't stop you. That can't stop you from building community. Paul and Barnabas, they were great friends, super close. They did everything together. A ton of ministries about them in that book of Acts about them building churches together and encouraging each other. But they had a disagreement, and their disagreement was so sharp that it separated them. Barnabas took John Mark. So he didn't leave. They might have got separated, but he didn't go by himself. He took John Mark with him and he sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas. He didn't do ministry on his own. He he left, it said, and the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious, gracious cure. See, even after this discouragement, even after all this is said and done, Jesus, I mean, Paul and 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 and, and um, Barnabas, they don't give up. They don't say, well, well, I tried partnering and, you know, it didn't work. I'm just going to go do it on my own. I'm going to fly solo. See, flying solo causes us to crash. Flying solo causes us to crash. And if you think about it, Paul, in all his epistles, always thanks somebody for doing ministry with them. Always. See, they knew that they needed others. Maybe your past experiences weren't good. I get that. But that doesn't mean you need to give up. You can't give up on something so crucial to your mental and spiritual health. Jesus needed others. And I'm not talking about just having disciples to have, have them help him spread the gospel. That, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying Jesus needed community for his health too. But you're saying, how, how is that? Jesus leaves and talks to God alone. He, he in, in this passage, he, that's what he does. He gets up, he leaves and goes to talks to God, God alone. Doesn't that show he's, he's isolating himself? Doesn't that show that he doesn't need support? Absolutely not. It says that he returned and found the disciples asleep. And he said, Simon, or Peter, Simon, why are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even an hour? See, Jesus needs them, and they're not there for. 
And that's what you're going to find out about community. It's, it's made up of people. We're flawed. You'll find that people are going to fail you. Okay, this is why so many people give up on community. But you got to continue to forgive. You got to continue to reach out. This is what Jesus did. He didn't stop there. He actually comes back two more times. And, and again, both times, they're, they're exhausted and they're sleeping. And these were his friends. Does he hold a grudge against them? No. Does he say, when I needed you the most, you weren't there? That's absolutely not what he does. No, nope. and even after the resurrection, uh, Jesus welcomes them back into, into their lives. One of the first things he does in Matthew after he's resurrected, it says the woman ran quickly from the tomb and they were very frightened, but they were also great, um, filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angels message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him and grasped his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to him, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee. And I'll meet them there. He's calling them back. He was calling them back to community. Why? Because the, he understood they needed it. He needed it. That it was a way to build on it. He forgave them. He calls them brothers. And because of this, they these disciples take what Jesus taught them, including the importance of community, and they go and share it with the world. And when they do it, the world gets changed. Check out in Acts 2. We're almost done. And in communion time, all believers, it says, devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A, a deep sense of awe came over them. All, and all the apostles performed many miracles and signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything. Look how many times it says all the believers, them, them all, or all the believers. I, I, and it keeps going on. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in the homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. And all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of what? All people, amen. And each day the Lord added to whose fellowship? Their fellowship with those being saved. It said they, I, if she counted that up, I didn't, I didn't count it, but it said they, there's so many, all, because it was community. I want to close with this. I want to close with this thought for you. I want to encourage you as we close. A lot of people believe that this, that during Acts, that was the finest time for the church. And I truly don't believe that. I think right now is the, is the finest time for the church if we get our acts together we, we we can bring that church back because it's never it wasn't spent meant to be left how do i bring community back in during a time of a pandemic when i can't sit and be with people while well, we're doing it right now you're doing it right now you need to find christian christian community the first thing you need to do is pray. Ask God, who should you be talking to? Who should you be putting in your life from church or friends that are godly? And when you come to church, when we meet next Sunday again, maybe come a couple minutes early, talk to somebody, get to know others. Watch live at five and Wednesdays and watch who's watching and maybe pick them and message them and ask them questions and start building a relationship. Maybe look right now who's watching and message them and, and start talking to them. Connect with them. Join the Bible study today. I put the link in the, in the message, copy it, paste it into Zoom, or click on it and it'll take you to Zoom. We'll be starting about five, 10 minutes right after service starts. Maybe you can sign up for Food for Your Soul. Find community there with people that need help with, 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 with their health, food, their, their health with mental health, their health with spiritual and their health with finances. Sign up. We'll have small groups starting again, hopefully in March. 
in person and on Zoom. Find a community of believers that you can live life with. Maybe you've tried reaching out before. I get it. Only to be hurt. But I want you to learn from Jesus. Reach out again. Don't listen to this. Don't allow past hurt to cause you to miss present help. Don't allow past hurt to cause you to miss present help. That's just good. I want to say don't allow past hurt to cause you to miss present help. See, the first garden shows us we were created for community in the best of times. And the second garden shows us the power of community in encouraging us during the worst of times. So finding community with other Christians is crucial. But we have to start with the most important relationship. And that's with God. We were created to be with God first in the Garden of Eden. In the second garden, Jesus prayed for strength in the Garden of Gethsemane. Because he wanted to have this relationship with you. <clears throat> in my devotional today, that Will and Christina gave me a year ago, it just happened from Charles Stanley. So it says, sometimes the longing to be loved, respected, and appreciated can be overwhelming. This is because we were created for intimacy. We were created for fellowship. We were created for community, for such a close relationship that you can bear your soul and, and, and still feel worthy, accepted, or protected. Of course, it says, though, Many of us ignore that need for intimacy, for community, for friendship, if we, because we've been hurt. We can also try to meet it with other things that never satisfy, such as possessions, uh, uh, sexual uh, endeavors, or addictions. But those will never truly replace the communion we yearn for or comfort for, like the love of Jesus brings. See, if you don't know that love of Jesus, if you don't have that relationship, that intimacy, the community with, with Christ, well, today's your day because it starts with that. It starts in, by you putting your belief, your trust, your faith in a, in a God that will never let you down, that will never leave you nor forsake you. If that's you today and you want to partake and accepting him as your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Dear Jesus, I need to have real Christian relationships. But most important, I need, the most important one is with you, Lord. Forgive my sins. Help me to follow you. I confess and believe that you are my Lord and Savior. And I want to live for you the rest of my life, getting to know you, and your love more and more. I pray this in your great name. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that for the first day today, uh, God bless. Let me know in the comment section. I have a, uh, a book I want to give you, a Bible. Plus, if you have prayed that, and that's the first or a thousand times, I, I, I want to know that because I want to be part of your community. I want to help you with your walk with the Lord. And I, I know others in our church would love to be a part of that also. So please let us know. And right now we are going to go end this service in a minute. We're going to do communion really quick. So please get your cup of coffee, your cracker, cookie, or tea, whatever you're going to be using. Um, and the reason I'm doing communion at the end of service is because in Acts, um, we're, it says all believers devoted themselves and they shared meals together including the lord's supper and that's what we're going to do we're going to remember what the lord did but it says all believers we practice open communion meaning if you are a believer it does not matter what denomination you are or whatever you are what if you're a believer i want to do communion with you and communion is about the remembering the sacrifice that the lord did for us on the cross paul wrote in first corinthians he said i received from the lord what i also delivered to you that the lord jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread so do me a favor pick up your cookie cracker whatever pick it up 
And he says, when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is in remembrance of him, of what he did for us on a cross. Taking communion, does that save us? No, the belief in Jesus Christ of what he did saves us. This is just a way for us to remember that he sacrificed his love for us and his life for us. So God bless. And it says, in the same way, he took the cup after the supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. This is not blood. This is the symbol of his blood poured out for all our sins. And he did it because he loved us so much. Lift up your cup. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us. We love you and we thank you. With that said, I love you all. And I thank you for watching and being a part of Impact Church. And I hope that you share this with your friends and family and coworkers to show that we are about community. We're about love. We're about uh, acceptance. We're about doing God's uh, will on this earth so we can glorify his name. I want you to remember, I love you, and I want you to one, remember to be a blessing. B-A-B. -B. God bless. We'll start the Bible study in about five minutes. Thank you, and have a great week.